So this is um, uh, going to be a, a general introduction, and then my colleagues are going to going to take over. So uh, it occurred to me that most, the, this is about mostly about the ocean tide. So it occurred to me there might there might be one person in the audience who doesn't know what the tide is. Uh, so what what we mean by the uh, the ocean tide is the the rise and fall of the sea uh, about twice a day, with a range sometimes of Liverpool of about ten meters. Uh, and also by the tide, we also mean uh, the ebb and flow of tidal currents. Clearly, to, to, to raise uh, the, the water level by 10 meters, you've got to have a current to bring the, the water in. Now, uh, okay, so it means those two things. So, as for example, this is a photo I took just out here a few years ago. This is just about as, uh, as low a tide as you can get in the Mersey. There's a great expanse of mud. The water is a long, a long way out. So this is what's called a very low, uh, very low spring tide. And in the other situation, almost the same place, looking in the opposite direction, uh, this is a, a high tide uh, and a bit of a storm as well. But it's a, a very high uh, spring tide. And the difference between those two photographs is about 10 meters of water level. So if you take the Mersey, just David Pugh and Jonathan Sharples and others will cover this in far more detail. But if you, the, the tidal cycle happens over roughly a fortnight. If you divide the fortnight into, into a week which has very big tides, we call them spring tides. And a week which has uh, a bit lower tides, we call them neat tides. So in the Mersey, the, the average range of the, uh, the tide at, um, at springs is about uh, 8.2 meters. I showed you that photograph before when it was 10, but on average in springs, they're about 8.2 meters. And at neap tides, they're about four meters. So uh, uh, whichever way you look at it, these actually um, are pretty big. They're not the biggest in the world by any means, but they are quite big. And the reason why we have such big tides around here will be covered by David and uh, Jonathan in their talks. Uh, the tide in most of the Mersey is uh, pretty much the same. They're slightly uh, larger up at, up at Eastham on the, on the ship canal. And because the tide, as you'll see later, uh, comes in, sweeps in um, from the Irish Sea, uh, then uh, the, the high tide is slightly uh, um, later as you go from Hilbury to Liverpool and then to Eastham. And as I said, to move all those, uh, that ma mass of water, you need tidal currents. Uh, so the currents through the straits, if you take the ferry boat, through the straits at, um, at Liverpool, uh, that's about four knots, two meters a second at spring tides. Uh, there is water coming down, of course, down the river from Warrington, but that's, for what we're gonna talk about today, that's irrelevant, absolutely tiny. It's very important for uh, fish, uh, you know, biodiversity and so on, but it's irrelevant in terms of what we're, talk the tide that we're gonna talk about. So the Mersey actually is not, we talk about the River Mersey, it's not really a river, as far as I'm concerned. We talk about the estuary, it's not really, really an estuary either. It's really a branch of the Irish Sea with a big tide in it. Okay, so um, a lot of our history is tied up with the tide. Um, unlike, unlike ports like Felixstowe, uh, which have a very, very small tide, ships can just go and tie up. They don't care about the tide, the, the crew just just leaves the ship where it is. But Liverpool's had a, a large tide uh, to, have to have to live with. And, and that can be a big dis disadvantage, commercial disadvantage, because clearly at, at low tide, uh, ships would sit on the bottom. And that was okay in the old days when you had very small uh, boats, but it's, that clearly you can't have uh, super tankers sitting on the bottom. That, that would be crazy. So that's why we have uh, docks, and uh, to keep the ships uh, permanently afloat at low tide and safe, of course, from the winds and the currents. Uh, and Liverpool had the first uh, dock, old dock, uh, in 1715. And many of you probably have been on the, the, tour, the tour of the old dock, which is um, under John Lewis there. So that's the old dock, the entrance of the old dock. Oh, I've got a pointer. Have oh, I got to switch it on, Rebecca? No, Oh, in fact, this is mine. <laughs> um, okay, so this is uh, the entrance of the old dock. Uh, it's paint this is one of Herdman's paintings. 
and he painted it from the position that we're more or less where we are now. Uh, this is the entrance of the old dock, just about on the dual carriageway on the strand there. This road here is the dual carriageway, what's now the strand. And uh, little ships, these, these little ones here, they're about 20, 30 tons or something, they could easily get into the dock at high tide. But at low tide, all this was mud, as I showed you in the first photograph. So they, they couldn't have got in, even a small ship like this couldn't get into the dock. And that's been true for um, most of Liverpool's history. So I'll give you some numbers. So ships can't get into the docks at low tide. And a lot of the time, they can't get into the docks at high tide, even. And this is called getting neat, because when the, when the, the tidal cycle is, small, is in its small phase, small tides, at neat tides, you can't get a, a good high spring tide to lift the ship into the dock. So if you take the old dock, for example, built in 1715, which is a fantastic dock, uh, then at, at the average high tide, uh, the 16 feet of water over the sill the sill is the thing that the gates sit on of the dock. So, six, so 16 feet of water was a tremendous amount of water in those days. And if you then go a hundred a century and a half later for Canada Dock and most of the North Docks, they only had 22 feet of water over their sills at uh, mean high water. So uh, that's not that's better, but it's not you know it's not tremendously much different. So it's obvious that a, a, a vessel with a draft of 22 feet couldn't have got into the docks, the north docks, on half of the high tides. So that's why it's such a commercial disadvantage. Now one thing I can do is advise you to read the books by Adrian Jarvis, who uh, knows far more than anybody about <coughs> Liverpool docks. And he gives this example of a, a vessel that draws uh, 26 and a half feet in 1890. This actually would be a big ship for 1890. But anyway, we're going through the, some uh, things in principle here. But anyway, a vessel of that size uh, could only get in and out of the, any of the docks in Liverpool on 138 days of the year. So that's a very big disadvantage for Liverpool. So what, what, what did they do? The ships had to partly unload and load in the river, which is a complete <coughs> waste of time. And uh, it made the dock management uh, very complicated. It could be done, though, if you had a very big high spring tide, then you could get the, even the bigger ships in. This is the, the first Mauritania, the 1906 one. At the time, it was the largest ship in the world. There were, there were 10 ships that were the largest ship in the world within 10 years before the First World War. And this, this was the largest at the time. This is getting into uh, Sandon Dock, and the draft of the Mauritania was 33 feet, so that's, that's, that was a big ship. But it could be done on the, on the highest uh, spring tide. This is not the last time you'll see this photograph. <laughs> yeah? Okay, we'll come back to this. The next one was Lusitania, as you know. This was also the, the biggest ship in the world at the time. And uh, if you didn't want to go to all the hassle of getting in and out of docks, and one thing, you, you just maybe had to... Uh, um, put down, pick up passengers, or mail, or something like that, then forget the docks. Uh, you could just have a, a, Liverpool just has this famous landing stage, two miles long, and the ships could just tie up alongside, uh, like that, in, in, uh, and keep afloat. That's the main thing. Uh, which um, the Lusitania is doing here. And of course, the ferries didn't want to get in and out of the docks. That would have killed off ferries. It would be totally impractical to run ferries with docks. So the ferry is tied up alongside the, uh, the landing stage. And of course, the ferry across the Mersey is part of our Liverpool DNA. So that's been uh, a constant feature of life. Those, um, a battle in Liverpool all the time has been the currents, the, the tidal currents carry sediment, muck around all the time. That gets everywhere that you don't want it to go. And uh, the whole history of Liverpool, to some extent, is building uh, um, bigger and better dredges. That's one reason that we have, if you know the, the channel into Liverpool, it's called the Crosby, the Queen's Channel. And uh, it has these uh, things called training walls alongside the channel through which the ships pass. These are not actually walls as such, they're actually heaps of builders' rubble and all kinds of horrible stuff. But the, the idea is to form a, um, basically a tube 
through which the tidal currents that I showed you before can, can speed up and of course the, the currents scour the, the bottom and they keep, largely keep the, the channel uh, free of sediment. Okay, moving to the present, more present time. This is a photo about a year ago of the launch of the Attenborough from Camel Earth. And uh, the question that you'll be able to answer after David's talk, probably, is why this ship was launched at 12 noon uh, on, on the Saturday 14th of July. And uh, the, uh, it isn't, wasn't just that the guests could drink champagne with their lunch. Although that was certainly true. And if, any, if there's anybody from Camel Herds here, here today, I'd like to talk to them at coffee time. Because none of us got an in invitation to the, <laughs> this one. Which has really cheesed me off, no end. <laughs> anyway, um, all ships at Camel Herds are launched pretty much on noon or midnight. But nobody wants to be there at midnight. Okay. And um, David or Jonathan will probably <coughs> explain why. And then there's, there's getting neat again. That's still a problem. So I mentioned before that uh, at mean high tide, the average high tide, there's 22 feet of water over the sill of Canada Dock. If you go forward then to Gladstone Dock, um, 1927, uh, there was 45 feet of water over the sill of that. That's, that's a tremendous improvement. And that's, been, that's served us well through most of the 20th century. But it's not enough for today. So the big container ships, uh, they draw about 40 feet which is getting pretty close. And the new uh, Panamax uh, ships with 20,000 containers on. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. They draw 50 feet. Okay. So this is getting serious, seriously deep. So that's why uh, Peel Holdings have built Liverpool 2, which um, is, means that these ships don't have to go into the docks. They can simply tie up um, alongside uh, the cranes and the, um, have the containers unloaded. Simon Holgate will talk about that. So getting on to the science now, in, in the years before the Liverpool Tidal Institute, these are, these are two of my all-time heroes in Liverpool. Uh, this is uh, Jeremiah Horrocks, who's uh, really an astronomer, uh, most famous for observe, predicting and observing the transit of Venus in 1639. One of the brightest guys England has ever produced. Even Isaac Newton was impressed by Horrocks, and Newton was the most miserable character you could ever, <laughs> ever come across. But he thought Horrocks was a genius, and it was a shame that he died so young, actually. But he, he measured the tide for three months at the river in Topsteth. The records are lost, but he, we know about this. And the other hero is Sir William Hutchinson, who's perhaps more famous. He was dock master <coughs> in Liverpool, and he measured the heights and the times of high tides for about 30 years. A tremendous achievement. Hutchinson's uh, data was used by the Holden brothers to produce the first good tide tables for anywhere in, in Britain. Moving on a bit though into the 19th century, um, uh, great progress was made in uh, the 19th century through this organization called the British Association for the Advancement of Science. It's nowadays called just the British Association. And uh, they had lots of um, studies of the tide by various people, but mostly by these two, I guess. This is uh, George Darwin, who was the son of Charles Darwin, the, the naturalist. And this is uh, William Thompson, who became um, Lord Kelvin, who was, Kelvin is a giant of 19th century physics. Um, scientists measure temperature, for example, to degrees Kelvin. And um, but there were other people. And what they did was basically express the tide. This is the only mathematics you'll have today, I, th I think. They, they expressed the tide, the total tide, as a function of time t, as a, a linear combination of cosines, which uh, with a certain speed, which came from astronomy, uh, a phase lag, and an amplitude. Uh, this is a very simple description of the tide, which we still use today, pretty much. So that was... Uh, Good work, but the, by the uh, early 20th century, this work had stalled. And so this takes us to why the Liverpool Tidal Institute was set up. And the, the story can start with this guy, Horace Lamb, Sir Horace Lamb, who at the time uh, was professor of applied maths at Manchester University. And Manchester still has a, a Horace Lamb a chair of mathematics 
um, in the university. So, uh, okay, and he actually, Lam, uh, worked on tides himself and fluid dynamics. Uh, but there was an up and coming uh, promising young uh, scientist called Joseph Proudman. And he um, wrote to Lam, it says 1913 here, I think it was a bit earlier. Uh, he wrote to Lam to ask if Lam could suggest a good, a good area for which Proudman could base his career. A very sensible thing to do. So Lam told him to work on tides. And I won't go into the, the topics which Lam told him to work on because they're extremely complicated and I still don't understand them. But anyway, that's what he was told to do. Uh, by um, 1916, then, uh, Proudman was a lecturer in applied maths in Liverpool at this time, and Lamb had been asked, asked him to prepare a report <laughs> for the British Association on the state of research in ocean tides. And that led to the suggestion of a tidal institute. It's always fascinating to me, one thing, that all this stuff was going on while people were dying in the trenches. And uh, most of these characters I'll mention here, they had health problems of one kind or another. It's quite, it's quite interesting. <laughs> but, um, okay. So anyway, this suggestion was taken up, and it was funded uh, by the, the, the Booth brothers, Alfred and Charles Booth, who ran the Booth Shipping Company. Shipping companies in those days were extremely important parts of Liverpool life. Uh, these are major benefactors of things in the university. <coughs> Uh, the, the LTI opened in March 1919, so we're a bit late. We thought nobody would come to, to, the, to the Albert Dock in a meeting in March, so we had it in May. Anyway, uh, the LTI was set up, and uh, Proudman, Joseph Proudman was appointed as its director, but he wasn't paid, but he got promoted anyway to be Professor of Applied Maths in Liverpool. And Arthur Dudson, he was paid for by the, the Booth brothers, um, salary of a few hundred pounds a year. The university provided an office and 10 pounds a year. And this, this continues the level of generosity that <laughs> Liverpool <laughs> University is very famous for, as, as Andy can testify. <laughs> if you want a slightly longer story, there's a, a version in um, David Cartwright's wonderful book about tides and an even longer version in a thesis by Anna Carlson, Carlson Hislop, which I can give you if you want. Okay, so the terms of reference were uh, to undertake research on aspects of the tide, uh, including what they call meteorological effects. This is what we now call storm surges uh, on the tide. And okay, we've done that. Uh, to form a training school of applied maths. I'm not sure we've done that. You could argue that we've done that. Um, to form a Bureau of Organised Information on the Tides, we've done that. And to undertake special pieces of work for commercial purposes. And we've done that, arguably too much, but anyway, we've done that. So the first uh, place that the LTI was in, the George Holt building. Holt was the, um, connected through his brother with the Blue Funnel Line, another shipping company. And that's in the building that you might recognise on Liverpool campus. And that was the room. This is a young Dudson writing a letter or something. And that's his first assistant whose name I've never found out. Do you know, Valerie? No. So this is Proudman, who actually was quite jolly in, in spite of his uh, this rather austere picture, and Arthur Dudson. And Proudman was actually a good historian as well as a scientist. And Dudson was excellent at handling numbers in the days before we had computers, of course and that led on to his work on tidal predictions. So, okay, it was set up in 1919. After the war, space got very short in the university, and meanwhile, they knew that um, the Mosey Docks owned Bitson Observatory over in Birkenhead, uh, where the work was rubbish, basically. <laughs> and uh, so the LTI moved over there in the 1920s, I think in stages, and by 1929, the observatory and the LTI were formally merged to, to create what was called the Liverpool Observatory and Tidal Institute. So the observatory where I spent part of, large part of my career is still there, as some of you may know. It's in private hands. The owners are here somewhere. And um, uh, in, a, in a very much better state now than it was a few years ago. So I mentioned um, it's 100 years, of course, of uh, oceanography at Liverpool. And just, I won't go into this in any detail, but 
basically, um, in 1919, uh, Sir William Herdman uh, endowed a chair in oceanography and became the first professor of oceanography in the department. And then later on a bit, um, Joseph Proudman of the LTI, he took over in 1933, and he, he was basically head of department, professor of oceanography anyway, until uh, about 20 years. So the links between the LTI and the university are, are very strong. Just to run through a few things, uh, tidal prediction was um, um, a speciality of Arthur Dudson. And he basically was responsible for um, tidal prediction machines, which predicted the tide in the days before uh, we had computers. They're sometimes called Kelvin machines. And they look rather like big, complicated clocks. And they're, they're, named, after, they're named Kelvin machines after the, after the inventor, Lord Kelvin. I showed you the photo before. About 30 were ever made. And we have three, three were in, in, uh, in Bitston. Um, and tides were calculated for many, many ports around the world for many, many years. So that's the, one of the, the three machines at Pittston, the so-called Kelvin machine. This is now in France, in the French hydrographic office. Why? why? Did somebody say? Uh, I'll explain why in a second. <laughs> it's very well looked after. Uh, the, the second machine um, is the so-called Roberts machine. And you can see that up the hill in Liverpool, in the university, if you want. And the third one is the so-called Hudson Leger machine. And that's um, a, a, one of the biggest machines ever made. Uh, the Germans made bigger ones, of course, but um, the biggest British one. And this is also on display up the hill in the university. OK, this is where I need Rebecca. So this is a little movie that, uh, that Chris took on his phone. <laughs> You're going to show this again? I'll probably slide it again. Okay, it's worth So basically, these tide machines look like big, complicated clocks. Uh, and they uh, simulated the tide by adding together um, different components of the tide, those cosines I showed you before. And what each wheel was associated with one of those cosines. And the, the function of the machine is to add them all up. To, to predict the tide for you. I'm not sure it was worth it, but. <laughs> okay, so most notably, of course, the, the two of those machines we used to, to create uh, tide predictions during World War II. This is the, uh, this is Rommel. In inspecting uh, the, the defences there, and the, the, the tidal predictions produced at Bitston for um, Allied landings in the Second World War were excellent. Uh, the Americans produced tidal predictions for use in the Pacific, and some of those were really bad, and they had many, many consequences. Uh, so I think um, Bitston did a very good job. All the work was done by teams of young ladies, and uh, uh, like this, and uh, a couple of them are here today. <laughs> We haven't changed much. <laughs> uh, like, if you were in nursing or any, any, any uh, funded by the public in any, any way, and here, uh, if you got married, you got the sack, I believe. I believe so. Until, when this photograph was taken, 1960 or something? 53, okay. Right. Okay, uh, I should say also what the, the grouped around the uh, one of the one o'clock guns. Uh, and this particular one o'clock gun is outside here. You can go see it after the, after the meeting, if you've not seen it already. Uh, Bitson also measured, the LTI measured the tide in the deep ocean. This is an instrument for measuring the tide in, in the ocean, uh, where, the, where the water is about maybe three miles deep. And also with satellites, this all won't mean anything. I'm not going to describe this, but this is basically a map of the main components of the tide called M2. And this is, the point I'm trying to make here is that we know the tide everywhere in the world to an accuracy of about two centimeters now. 
uh, th thanks to lots of things. Some brief other things that was done in, in the LTI was storm surges. Roger Father is here, who was um, a leader in that stuff. And that really took off, off after the 1953 floods in the North Sea, which did a lot of damage to a lot of people. 300 people in Britain were killed, I think. But uh, produced funding for the next 20 or 30 years. And um, we took advantage of that, pretty much. And that, of course, led to the Thames Barrier being built. Long-term changes in sea level were a particular interest in Bitstam. It was a center for collecting data from around the world, all, all measurements around the world. And these are measurements, um, most recently, for Britain. I thought I'd show you this. These are uh, six places in Britain from 1960 to 2018, from Aberdeen down to Newlyn in Cornwall. All of these are going up. Okay, uh, you've had a lot of, you're probably saturated with stuff on TV about climate protests, Attenborough and all the, all the rest. The sea level is going up, and as is temperatures and so on. And don't let anybody tell you different. And if you, this is a, actually a map, a plot that came from the University of Colorado, but this is also of great interest in um, at the LCI. And this is showing the present day rates of change of sea level of about three millimeters a year globally. So, of course, the raise of sea level affects us and it affects people on lot islands a lot more. Okay, I'll finish now. But the, um, the LTI changed its name almost as often as some people change their socks, but this maybe eight or nine times. And amusingly, it was called the Proudman Oceanographic Laboratory twice in its, in its history. Brian McCartney was director of the, the of poll for um, a long time. You see it today. And until nine, nine, 2010, when it was merged with Southampton Centre to, to form what's called the National Oceanography Centre. But I think the, the LTI has a lot to be proud of. Um, it produced three fellows of the Royal Society, Proudman, Dudes, and, and David Cartwright, who was my boss for many years. Cartwright always wore this re revolting uh, grey pullover <laughs> for reasons which maybe his wife needed it. Okay. Uh, work was transferred in 2005 to a new building on the, on the campus in Liverpool, which is a nice clean building. If you want to know more about life at Bitston in the LTI, there's a PDF I can give you by Eric Jones, which is, is very good. Uh, Joyce Scofield, who's here, wrote a book about, about the place and the people, which uh, you can get from a uh, public library at least. Okay, so that's my introduction. Uh, what's going to happen now is well, there are going to be two talks now, one by David Pugh on the science behind the tide and one by Judith Wolfe on um, how tides are going to basically rescue Britain's energy requirements, which is really important. Then we have a coffee break to recover and then there are four more talks which will cover some of the things I've talked about just now. Very briefly, uh, they're not building... Um, I mentioned before, that's open today. After all this, if you've still got an appetite for this stuff, if you want to go up there and have a look around, you're welcome to do that. And if you want to go see the machines, you, you, the tide machines, you can sign up for a tour, I think they're every month or something, um, at this website. Okay, I've probably taken too long, so I'm gonna use my time up. And uh, so what I'm gonna do now is, oh yeah, I, I've gotta thank our sponsors. So the museum have been really great. Rebecca and her colleagues, really, very really good. Uh, Lisco, uh, there's stuff about Lisco outside, which you can read. <coughs> uh, importantly, Lisco are paying for our tea and coffee. Uh, and also the Centre for Port and Maritime History, which is a joint thing between the universities and the museum. So thank you all very much for that. <laughs>